Okay, uh, let's get uh, started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Oh. And today is our great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Thanks. Robin Waters uh, from Northeastern University to give us uh, a talk. Uh, Robin is now a postdoc uh, at the uh, um, uh, College of uh, Computer Science. Uh, he joined uh, uh, the uh, Curry College in July 2020. Uh, through a ex, uh, experimental AI program, and he formerly was uh, a Zalavsky research instructor in the mathematical department at the Law System. His research studies the connection between representation theory, differential equations, and differential equations, both theoretically and uh, practically using equivalent neural networks. Today, he's going to talk about equivalent neural networks for dynamics. Robin, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, okay, so uh, here I have a bunch of um, different application domains that a lot of people care a lot about. And all of these domains have two things in them that I'm interested in. So one, they all contain some dynamical systems and they all contain some symmetries. And what people wanna do is they wanna make predictions or classifications about these dynamical systems. Uh, and usually this is very hard to do. So just like making predictions about the climate or the motion of vehicles or the movement of the stock market, all of these things are very um, difficult problems. And what we wanna do is use leverage the symmetries in these problems to make solving them easier. So I like to juxtapose uh, my work with the traditional method for predicting dynamics, which is to form a mathematical model, for example, in the form of writing down a differential equation for your dynamics, and then solving it with numerical methods versus my method, which is to use a neural net network. Um, so each of these advantages, each of these methods has advantages and disadvantages. So if you write down a differential equation and solve it using integration techniques, um, you have the advantage that you know what went into your model. It's based on some first principles that you know. Um, you can bake in various conservation laws you want to observe. It's extremely flexible. You can use the same differential equation to describe a vast number of different phenomena often. And you don't need very much data about your system, usually just enough data to set a couple constants. Um, so like in, in, in these categories, deep learning does pretty poorly. Um, Deep learning is just going to be um, training. We need lots of data to train it. It comes with no guarantees. It's just a black box that sort of learns, tries to learn the function from the data. So we don't know that it conserves certain quantities. And um, there's also a big problem with generalizability in these models. So what you almost always find with people training neural networks to predict dynamical systems is that they have to retrain the neural network for each different sort of time series that they're working with. And they can't really um, sort of like leverage um, a network that can predict ocean currents in one ocean to predict ocean currents in a different ocean, for example, uh, unlike the mathematical model. Um, on the other hand, there are some problems with um, using um, numerical methods, um, which deep learning can fix. So one is, you, if you're going to write down a differential equation, you really need to know exactly what dynamics exist in the system. And in deep learning, those can just be inferred. The, the big killer thing here is that um, realistic like uh, modeling of high dimensional dynamical systems is extremely computational demanding. I work with someone, for example, like at Los Alamos Laboratory. They study, um, they study um, high pressure fluid mechanics and you know, they, ru they run on supercomputers for months to get a couple seconds of, of data. Um, and the other thing is I need to know all of the inputs. So if I'm missing like some knowledge about some boundary conditions or some external inputs, then my model will fail. In, in contrast, deep learning can infer those um, from data. So, so anyway, it's kind of a, a poor bargain here, I think, in that, um, you know, I kind of, I want the advantages of each of these things, but there's some trade-off. And so um, this is sort of the main focus of my research, which is, is there a way that I can combine the advantages of deep learning um, with traditional mathematical modeling? And um, what I'm gonna talk about in this talk is using equivariant neural networks as a way to get that um, knowledge that we have into what would otherwise just be a black box. 
So aquavariant neural networks are neural networks that explicitly incorporate prior knowledge of symmetry. So here's the pipeline for how I apply um, aquavariant neural networks to a um, dynamics modeling problem. So first, I um, find a mathematical model for the system in the form of a differential equation. I extract the symmetry group of the differential equation. Um, in, 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 I mean, um, in practice, this is not very hard to do. In fact, like a lot of differential equations are um, actually the result of first identifying what symmetries you want to observe and then finding an equation that satisfies them. Um, so then having done that, I forget the mathematical model, but remember it's symmetries. And then I create a neural network that explicitly incorporates those symmetries. And then I use that neural network to solve the differential equation. So that's the strategy that I follow. And if you do this compared to the normal deep learning strategy, you, um, you realize a lot of advantages. So one is you need a lot less data. Two is the models can be smaller and models these days are reaching into the billions of parameters. So that's a real issue. Sorry about that. Um, oh, sorry, my slideshow broke. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, um, next it gives you some, so normally in neural network, you have no like um, provable behavior, but here we have some at least provable consistency behavior. Um, and another thing we see is increased energy conservation, right? When you observe the, the symmetries of the physical system, one result is that you are better at conserving um, corresponding energy and momenta. And um, another thing that we see is this improved generalization. So, so relative to only being able to predict one system at a time, now um, we have a decent chance of generalizing to other systems that were not part of our training data. Matt, Matt um, okay. I'll ask a quick yeah. question. So when you, when you mentioned this, find the differential equation, means you know the equation you have to, or you have to learn the equation? In this case, I'm saying that you know the equation. So I'm saying like, suppose you want to, you stu want to study some system, Right, you 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 want to combine like the knowledge that scientists have gathered over 150 whatever years together with a neural network, and you want to tell the neural network to some extent what we already know about the physics we're trying to study. Okay. Um, that's a good, that's a good point. Okay, uh, okay. So now I'm going to talk explicitly about how do you build an equivariant neural network. So I want to cons I want to respect some symmetries. So I'm going to um, set up, a sim identify a symmetry group. So um, what are symmetry groups? So a symmetry group is a set and uh, a composition operation that just contains some symmetries. So here's the dihedral group, which are the rotations and reflections of an equilateral triangle. So this is a finite symmetry group, um, but there are very many um, there are many groups. For example, here's SO2. So this is a compact but infinite group that gives me the symmetries of a circle. Um, and so there are very many different types of symmetry groups. And I think I just um, like to point out that if you're trying to build a network that is equivariant to one of these symmetry groups, the properties of the group that you are trying to model play a big role in how you do that and how challenging it might be. Uh, for example, the infinite group SO2 is harder to build an equivariant neural network for than a finite group like the dihedral group. Okay, so um, I'm a representation theorist, uh, not a group theorist. So to me, the interesting th part about groups is that the same symmetry group can have different uh, representations. So here's the cyclic group of order four, which contains four elements. And when I multiply R to the fourth power, I get back to the identity. Um, and I want to represent this, so I want to have a concrete action on different vector spaces. So, um, so representation simply sends each element of the abstract group to an n by n matrix, and the multiplication table under matrix multiplication needs to be the same as the multiplication for the abstract group. So in this case, I'm going to send R to some two by two matrix, and that matrix to the fourth power must get back to the identity matrix. So sort of an obvious two by two representation would be 90 degree rotation. And you can check, right? If I take this matrix to the fourth power, I get the identity. But this is not the only representation of this group. Here is um, an equally natural representation of this group uh, on R4, where I'm going to permute the four um, 
vertices of this square in the stand, I'm going to permute the four standard basis element, uh, standard basis vectors of R4. And so R gets sent to a four by four permutation matrix. And again, if I take this to the fourth power, I can see I get back to the identity. So same group, different representations. And this is also going to be very important for building an equivariant neural network. Um, okay, so what is an equivariant function? So, um, so in this, in in the in the supervised learning setting, what you do is you often imagine that you have ac you are trying to model some ground truth function. So for us, we want to think that's some function f from some r uh, d in to r d out, and we want to learn this function. And saying that this function observes certain symmetries coming from the group G means that um, this function is G equivariant. Uh, which simply means that I assume the group that RD in and RD out are both representations for my group G. I have some specified action of G on these spaces. And I would like F to respect that action in the sense that if I transform the input of F, that would be the same thing as having transformed the uh, output. So in other words, F intertwines the action of the group. Right, and here's that like in a picture form, this is like a, some velocity field and my map F here is just scaling all the vectors up by one. And if I were to perform a 45 degree rotation on that velocity field and then scale all the vectors up by one, that would be the same thing as first scaling the vectors up by one and then um, performing the rotation. So here um, the rotation commutes with F and so F is equivariant. So that's the sort of a priori knowledge I want to try to leverage when I build a neural network that learns this function f. Okay, so how do I build a neural network that learns this function f? So notice uh, we're going to model f, so rd in is the input space. And uh, by the way, I'm not that familiar with WebEx. You can see my cursor? Yes. Uh, when I just, yes, okay, great. So an rd out is the output space, right? And as I've just said, we know that the group G acts on the input space, we'll say by representation rho in, and it also acts on the output space by representation rho out, okay? And now to make a neural network, right, all I have to do is I have to create alternating linear layers, so this matrix M1, then an activation function, that's sigma one, then a linear layer, that's M2, then an activation function, that's sigma two, then another linear layer and as many layers as I want. And then the composition of all of these functions will be my neural network, right? Now, since the function F is given to me and the symmetry G is given to me on the input and output, um, I know them, but the hidden layers that I'm introducing here, RD1, RD2, these are all intermediate spaces or hidden or latent representations, and they don't have um, a priori actions of this group G. And so choosing how the group G acts on these hidden layers by row one and row two is one of the important things that you have to do when you're building an equivariant neural network. Uh, and that choice can have a big impact on how well the network is able to optimize and learn the ground truth function. So what does a linear layer look like? So let's imagine that the symmetry group is the group C4 that I gave in the last slide for this example. And I have this linear mapping from RD1 to RD2. So uh, I guess in this case, let's say this is R, the D1 is equal to two and D2 is equal to four. So I'm going from two to four dimensions. So this is a, um, this is a uh, four by two matrix that I want to learn. And I would like this matrix to be equivariant with respect to these two group actions, this one by 90 degree rotations and this one by permutation of the standard basis elements. So uh, basically you can write down that constraint and solve it and you will get that the space of four by two matrices that respect that symmetry um, has this pattern. So in other words, from an eight dimensional space of symmetries, the space of intertwiners is only two dimensional and has this, this um, this basis shown in this thing. So that's the sort of process I do for finding equivariant linear layers. And then the equivariant nonlinearities that are part of what make a neural network expressive, those, those you also need to um, be careful about and find, right? And notice it heavily depends which activations are gonna commute with these things depends on um, the choice of hidden representations. And that's part of the key to, um, to um, 
why certain hidden choices of representations for the group G may make a neural network learn better or worse is because it, certain activation functions, certain nonlinearities are going to make for better or worse loss landscapes. So for example, if rotation is your action, then the neural network or the activation function needs to be um, radial. That is, it needs to preserve the direction of the vector in order to be equivariant. Okay, um, and then this is just like, a, um, a statement in one of our papers um, that, that says that um, basically to be an equivariant neural network, right, you need all of the connections in your network to be equivariant. And if that's the case, then the full network will also be equivariant. Okay, so um, since, since this is a math department, I'll just go through the actual like uh, thing of how I would actually build an equivariant neural network. So here's just a little simple example for you. Um, so how would you find the space of intertwiners F from R3 to R3? So in other words, I want a linear function from R3 to R3, which is equivariant with respect to the following C3 action on the space, which is the cyclic permutation of the coordinates. So in other words, I want it to be the case that if I cyclically permute the coordinates of my input vector and then multiply by the matrix, that's the same thing as first applying the matrix and then cyclically permuting the coordinates. And the answer is that such a matrix would have the following form, which is called a circulant matrix. Um, so, uh, so the proof's if and only if, so I'll just prove the forward direction and you can prove the backward direction on your own. But basically this repeating pattern of weights means that by direct computation, if I multiply by this input vector x, right, I get this vector. And if I first permute the input vector and then multiply the matrix, I get this. And I simply observe that um, the output is the original vector, but permuted, which means that the permutation of entries, cyclic permutation of entries commutes with the application of m. Um, and I guess like uh, it's a bit of an aside, but maybe I'll just say like if you want to prove the reverse direction, then what you can just observe, right, is that if I replace this matrix uh, with nine unknowns, right, and I can make these computations and set them equal, and I assert that this should be true for all X and Y, um, then essentially what I will get is I will get a linear um, restriction on the space of entries of the matrix M and solving that linear um, system will give me my solution. So in this case, you, what you would see is that you'd see that the linear system um, restricting the weights is of rank uh, six. And that's why I get three degrees of freedom here. Okay, uh, sorry, yeah, okay. So that's, that's sort of the background. That's how you make equivariant neural networks. So uh, if anyone has like uh, any questions about that, you Matt, can ask them Matt. now and then we will model fluids in a second. Yeah. yeah. One small question. So yeah. if my understanding is correct, so so which means every layer of the parameters is like a uh, is like this kind of matrix. If you make it equivalent. Exactly. Yeah. So yes. That because this matrix essentially, if you use some mm, some a uh, Fourier transformation, right? This matrix can be efficiently uh, compute and determine all those things. But my question is, somehow this mm -hmm. restricted the capacity of the network, right? That's, yeah, that's, well, it depends what you... Maybe that's what you want, because I... if your system is equivalent or whatever, you may want to reduce the capacity. Yeah. That's the advantage. But if the system is not, that may not, I, I don't know, what's, what's your... Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, um, that's a great question. Certainly you've thought about this problem before. Um, so yes, we, so on the one hand, I reduced capacity because I went from eight free parameters to two. Um, on the other hand, you could think about what that is, is I have, since the ground truth function is equivariant, presumably I want the, uh, a matrix of this form in my network, right? So what I've just done is I've solved six out of the eight uh, degrees of freedom. So I've gotten closer to the correct answer. That's like one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it, another way of thinking about it is, um, you know, there's no reason I couldn't stack a bunch of these representations together. So this is like row one, and this is uh, the regular representation. So I could take, you know, 128 copies of the regular representation of 256 copies of the, um, the um, row one representation. I guess I call it row two here, right? And the result is that um, 
somehow I have fewer free parameters for larger dimensional features. And so I can um, possibly be more expressive. Um, so it just, um, it's a it's a kind of a subtle question, I guess. I see, I see. But, but uh, another naive question, right? Because uh, here you force every la every layer is 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 this kind of matrix, right? But mm -hmm. I mean, every layer is a circle in the matrix. But is that possible? Because the target the approximation function you would like to have if it's equivalent. But is that possible? Each intermediate layer is not equivalent, but the product is it might be equivalent in the sense that you do not sacrifice the capacity, but at the same time you approximate whatever the the hypothesis is correct. <laughs> I'm not sure. That's you... right. That's right. So. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. So in other words, like if two function, if f and g are equivariant, then f compose g is equivariant. But it's not if and only if. f compose g could be equivariant, even though f and g are not, That's, right? Yeah. So like the original strategy that people used to try to make networks equivariant was to take a non-equivariant neural network and symmetrize it, right? Which essentially means like I take my non-equivariant neural network f, I pass it at, uh, a bunch of inputs transformed by different group elements, and I look at their outputs, right? Now that combined function, right, for a finite group is going to be, um, is going to be an equivariant function for the regular representation of that group where I've, I've lifted to the regular representation. Um, so empirically, it doesn't work as well, and it's, it's difficult to explain. So not a lot of work has been done on this other type of doing things, but the the intuition that I think you know people like uh, uh, Rishi Kondor and Taco Cohen sort of share about why they they think that sort of symmetrized non-equivariant network doesn't work as well as this equivariant network is that deep learning is really um, people feel is is dependent on learning very good hidden representations. So these like intermediate representations need to represent some thing, some idealized or very good form of the input. And if you just symmetrize the entire function instead of making the function equivariant, it means that the hidden features don't really understand or know anything about the symmetry. Right. So if you want your hidden features to also be equivariant functions of the input, then you have to do it this way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, so that's there's actually there's a nice theorem in Condor and Trivedi that says like right it says I think if it says the hidden features of your network will be equivariant transformations of the input if and only if um, given a couple other hypotheses each of these intermediate layers is some form of group convolution which yeah, is yeah. not how I'm presenting it here but <laughs> I, know, I know that work yeah yeah. So, but here's here's my um, here's my little idea. So anyway, basically, I guess the point is like from here, it's going to get more complicated in in how I set up the equivariance. But basically, every version of equivariance is essentially some fancier version of this picture. So if you can understand this, then you can basically understand all equivariant neural networks. Okay, so. Um, Going back to sort of like my original slide where I said like there are dynamics areas people care about and we want to accelerate them. Here's like a really like class, like good example, good target where people really care about predicting fluid mechanics for like engineering applications and climate science, but it is unbelievably time consuming to simulate um, Navier-Stokes equations to high physical fidelity. So can we use a neural network to do it much, much, much faster? So um, basically people started working on stuff like that around 2017 and what they quickly learned um, was that you can get, you know, there's a paper of Thompson from 2017 where they do prediction fluid mechanics. Uh, and basically they looked at the, um, the videos and the videos looked pretty good. And then they looked at the like energy conservation error and they found that it was pretty bad. And so they said um, that their application was 3D animation, right? So they wanted to find a domain that um, people would be okay with having a very pretty video, even if it's not physically realistic. So our goal is to get something physically realistic. So I'm gonna follow this pipeline going back here. Um, so find the differential equation, extract its symmetry, incorporate that symmetry into an equivariant neural network, and then actually solve the differential equation. So 
I want to do fluids. So here's the Navier-Stokes equation in a simplified form. Now I'm going to say, what are the symmetries of the Navier-Stokes equations? So there's sort of two of them. There are the Galilean invariant symmetries, and there's a scaling law. Okay. Now I want to set this up as a, a deep learning problem. So I say I'm going to learn a neural network f theta. Theta here is the dependence on the parameters, um, where it takes the velocity fields for uh, the past k plus one time steps and tries to predict the future velocities in the next time step. So we've discretized time here. Um, and this is only predicting one time step into the future, but uh, all you have to do is take your output, add it onto your input, and apply f again and continue in order to unroll the dynamical system through time. OK, so the point is the following. If I have invariances of the differential equation, so transformations I can do that would leave this differential equation invariant, then the forward prediction function, as I call it, should be equivariant with respect to these symmetries. So for example, rotation is one of my symmetries. If I rotate all of these fluid fields, that's basically the same thing as looking at my fluid field from a different angle. And then if I forward predict that, I should also get the fluid field, but looked at from a different angle. So there's an, these are all equivariances. And I want to incorporate these equivariances into my neural network, F theta, that I'm going to use to try to learn fluid mechanics. OK, so I'm just going to say, so uh, I'm just going to say what the symmetries are. OK, so the Galilean invariant symmetries just come from arbitrary choices of coordinate systems that I make when I write down data. Right, so there's no uh, fixed origin for my velocity field. If I move the origin, it shouldn't matter. Um, if I change the orientation of my velocity field, that's just artificial data I had to impose. Uh, and the last one is the, the, the fun one where I guess like um, you look at a tank of fluids um, and write down all its velocities. And then actually it turns out that is a tank of fluids that is on a train. And if you are standing on the train platform and writing down the velocities of all the fluids, well then mostly you see the velocities as traveling in one direction. So this is a uniform motion or a Galilean boost, right? And all of these are artificial, and I would like to be invariant to them. OK, the last one um, is my favorite one. So this is just the scaling um, factor. So this is uh, basically the fluid mechanics observe a scaling law that if I scale space up by some factor lambda, and I scale time by some factor lambda squared, and as a consequence, I end up scaling velocities by um, lambda as well, right? Then the uh, the differential equation I get will be invariant, right? Uh, basically, if you perform all of these, then the lambda will factor out, and you can divide it. Okay. And so, I mean, that's kind of uh, that's kind of interesting because we we sort of take as given the idea of making scale models for things. Like we just think we have the uh, God-given right to make tiny little airplanes and put them in wind tunnels and then decide that that means we know how big airplanes will work, right? But if it wasn't for the scaling law, that would be completely irrelevant, right? You can't, um, you can't take a giant um, elephant and scale it down to make a tiny elephant and then do biology on it and learn things about a big elephant because um, they, the biological systems just don't observe the same scaling law. So the scaling law is very important. OK, so OK, so having said what the symmetries of the function f are, how do I build a neural network that is equivariant to those symmetries? So I'll just cover this, the scaling case. Um, so here, I think um, this depends a little on sort of how familiar you are with um, neural networks. So this function here, so probably um, it's, uh, since it, um, this audience is math, you know uh, what convolution is. And this function would roughly be convolution if this was a minus sign, except that um, there's a convention in machine learning that you make it a plus sign, which makes it non-symmetric in the inputs, but no one cares. Um, so this is convolving the input w with this uh, kernel function k. Uh, and you get the output uh, v, right? Now, um, because if you think away about the way convolution works, right, you are integrating the same kernel along the input w at all the locations. Same, the same kernel gets moved across the entire input, right? And what that means is that convolution is shift equivariant. 
So if I take a input function and shift it over and then convolve it with some kernel K, the output will be the same thing I would have gotten without the shift, but shifted over. Okay, so this is a really common thing in machine learning. You see it everywhere and people really value it for its shift equivariance. So we basically apply the same philosophy here, but over scale as well. So here what we have is we have the input W with its spatial and its um, temporal components. And we add this uh, extra component that it basically corresponds to scale, right? And then we can evolve with a kernel across different scales. And what you see, right, is the scaling law, right, that I showed you that the physical system observes, that's this anisotropic scaling law, it scales space and time differently. What we do is we move, we don't just shift the input relative to the kernel, we also rescale the input relative to the kernel across all the different, uh, across all the different scales. So ideally this would be some kind of integral over all scales lambda. Practically it's a computer, so, what we do is we pick a finite number of sort of discrete scales and sum over them, which means that this method will be scale equivariant sort of within a certain range, but it will accumulate error outside of that. Um, but it's the same philosophy. So here translate gives you translation equivariance. Here we translate and scale and we get translation and scale equivariance. Okay, and here's sort of a, a picture illustrating um, what this works looks like, right? Where the same exact kernel weights are both translated across the input and applied to the input at different scales. Okay, so um, so in, in a deep, uh, so this is also an empirical work. So here I'm gonna show some empirical results. Um, so this is a really big table, which appears in our, our um, paper, but I'll just zero in on this one column here. So what we see here is the um, attempts to predict the future velocity fields of some fluids undergoing Raleigh-Bernard convection. Um, at the top line here, what I have is a non-equivariant model, ResNet. And what we're doing in this experiment is we are taking a model, we're training it on some data, and then we are testing that model on data that is outside of the distribution, train distribution, because it's been rescaled. So we train this ResNet on um, fluid data at various scales, um, and then we see if it can generalize to some slightly different scale. And what we see is that it, it fails completely, so it gets a very uh, a reasonably high error of 1.96, right? Whereas our model, which is this equa scale down here, gets an error of 0 0.85. So I'll just focus in on, on that part. Um, now I'll fill in what this middle one is. So um, basically, when people first proposed equivariant neural networks, you can go and um, look at the reviews because they're on open review. Basically, the machine learning community's response was, we don't need your fancy representation theory to deal with symmetry. We already have a technique and that technique works fine, which is that if we would like a model to be better at generalizing to things at different scales, then what we should do is given the train data, we should show it much more training data, but where we rescale that training data so that it has a chance to see lots of data at lots of different scales. This is called data augmentation. And um, that's what sort of we think of as our primary competitor to uh, equivariance. And, what we see here, I think, is two things. One is that um, this comparatively simple idea works extremely well. So you do go from 1.96 to 1.01 in error. So data augmentation works great, but it doesn't work nearly as well as equivariant neural networks do. And it's far more time consuming, right? Because you have to add a lot more data to your training regimen that you've rescaled so that it can learn to generalize over scale, whereas equivariant neural networks automatically do, which is basically what this proposition down here is saying, that equivariant neural networks don't really need data augmentation. Okay, so here's just some pictures to go with this uh, conclusion. So this graph is probably worth looking at. So here what we're doing is we're taking the data and we are scaling it up and we're tracking the error of both our network, the blue one, and the non-equivariant network, the gray one. And what you can see is as you scale the data, the non-equivariant network acquires more and more error, whereas the equivariant network 
network that is has built in equivariance to that rescaling factor maintains a pretty low error. Um, so for these pictures, um, you can see, for example, so here we're testing out different uh, equivariances to different symmetries, right? The top column here, uh, top row here, gives you these are the true videos of the actual fluids moving, right? This middle column is the non-equivariant models trying to learn those fluids. So hopefully these look different than these, which, and then the bottom one is our methods. Um, I don't know how well WebEx is is reproducing the videos or not, but at least like for this middle column, it should be clear the top one and the bottom look similar, but the middle one doesn't. It's is that coming across? Okay. Um, okay. So here's here's probably my favorite experiment in this in this case. So here what we did was we downloaded. So in uh, in in the machine learning world, part of what makes machine learning work is that it should work on real data. So here's, um, this is real analysis ocean current data. So it has been processed through a model, um, but it is based on um, satellite sea surface, temp sea surface level observations. And then they model the velocity fields from that. Um, and what we did was we took data in different oceans. We trained the model in one of the oceans, and then we tested it on a different ocean, right? And the question is, is a model that has learned in one ocean, can it perform well on data in a different ocean, which maybe has like different, like um, if there's different boundary conditions, different um, heating and different uh, forces at play, right? But they might be related to the forces that you see in the other ocean if they're rotated or rescaled versions of those. So um, basically what we see, right, is that our equivariant methods down here, right? So this is the test domain column, right? Have much lower error than the non-equivariant method. Right, and this column ESE, so energy spectrum error is what this is. So this is a, a way that people in uh, who do um, computational fluid mechanics um, try to determine uh, how um, how do I put it? So it's a instead of just taking like the total energy in the system, what energy spectrum error does is it breaks apart the energy at different um, at different wave numbers. So basically, like you can see as you look at the sort of fluid that there's a, there are different amounts of energy in tiny little eddies versus in large eddies. There's energy at different scales. So the energy spectrum error is tracking is the spectrum of how much energy there exists at different scales in the fluid. So it's a more granular um, notion of where the energy is. Um, and what imposing equivariance does for us is it gives us much lower um, errors um, frequently, right? Um, for example, this 0 0.28 after imposing rotational equivariance than the baseline model would have, right? So I think that's pretty neat. Okay. Okay, so that'll that'll do it for my, my fluid mechanics. I'm gonna go on to trajectory predictions. So. Uh, Maybe, are there any questions about the fluid equivariant neural networks for fluid mechanics? Okay. All right, so, um, so the advantage for fluid mechanics, right, was that I, I told you, and you either know or believe me, that it was extremely time consuming to use, um, to use uh, direct numerical computation to solve these systems. And so that's why we'd want to use deep learning on it. I think the cell for doing some trajectory prediction uh, like this is much easier um, because <laughs> I don't really know differential equations that you could solve that would perfectly tell you where these cars are going to go, right? There are some physics obviously that govern the motion of cars, but um, each of these drivers clearly has some independent uh, behavioral aspects and goals and reasons to be a certain place at a certain time that you're never going to learn with a differential equation. So in other words, what we have here is a partially observed dynamical system um, where unless you could actually model all of the neurons and all of their brains as well, you could never really like calculate numerically. And so the deep learning model is gonna take this, uh, this 
trajectory prediction with these different agents, and it's going to be able to infer things about human behavior and the interaction that it can then use to make better predictions than a strictly numerical model. Um, and I think it's pr probably obvious from the get-go, right, why, why we're interested in trajectory prediction, right, which is that people trying to put autonomous vehicles on the roads, and those autonomous vehicles need to make inference about the other vehicles that have human drivers in them and what they're going to do to avoid colliding with them. So this is a pretty important problem. Um, so we're going to do this on two different data sets. So we're going to do it for pedestrians and also for vehicles. Um, and uh, I just sort of point out in these bullet points here, right, that a lot of the uh, original um, benefits for equivariant neural networks that I promised uh, we're going to uh, realize here. Okay, so what is the symmetry in this problem? So this is kind of neat. So um, the differential equation, right, that doesn't exist here, right? So in the fluid mechanics world, I have the Navier-Stokes equations. I extracted symmetry. Here, I have no differential equation, but, and this is what's so great about symmetry, I definitely still have the symmetry, right? So in this example, what I'm sort of showing is that there's this bias where the behavior of various agents or cars in the scene is mostly influenced by the agents around them. And also um, for the most part, although this is a bit of an approximation, for the most part, people don't really care about what absolute compass direction they're headed in, right? They mostly, most of the way that human agents drive cars is based upon relative orientations. So what that means is that even though these two intersections are actually different, if you look at all these blue cars, you'll see they're in different places. These three cars with this um, green car kind of cutting this red car off are in the same situation in these two places, but rotated. So, um, and so what that means is that if our network is able to learn the dynamics that occur in these two scenarios, in one of these scenarios, it ought to be able to generalize and apply it to the other scenario if it understands that rotation is the symmetry of the system. Um, I guess, if depending on how much you think about neural networks, it's probably worth pointing out that this might seem kind of unremarkable because symmetry is so deeply built into human intuition. Um, but think about what this input looks like to a computer, right? So if I take the vector of these values up here and the vector of these values up here, from the neural network standpoint that's trying to learn the distribution of input and output values, these are simply completely different data points that have nothing to do with each other, right? So your brain relates them, but a neural network has to learn, would have to learn each of these situations and what happens completely differently unless you tell it about symmetry. So part of what we're doing here is trying to teach neural networks to do things that humans do without thinking about them. Okay, so here's our model. So this is the equivariant continuous convolution model. Um, so this is a sort of a, a, it's got a lot of boxes here, but it basically has two big parts. So basically there's a bunch of cars in the scene and we encode all of their data into some big latent vector. And we take, um, Basically, the encoding happens in three parts. So we do an encoding that takes in all the background information about like where the lanes and the road boundaries are. We take into account each agent on its own and its entire past. That would be like maybe it's learning some behavioral aspects about a single driver. And then we also encode some information about the interactions of cards that are near each other. And that all goes into some big encoded vector that stores all the information we know about the past. And then that vector is passed forward to this part of the model, which takes that past vector and sends it through many layers of uh, some convolutional operator. And then the model is expected to produce the deltas on the positions for all the cars in the scene for a single time step. And then of course you can repeat that process to see where you go as far as you want into the future. Okay, so, um, so I've got some circles and tori here. So this is part of the sort of secret of um, how do I make this model equivariant? So part of the reason I spent so much time in the beginning talking about how the same group can have different representations and sort of trying to emphasize that the choice of the hidden, uh, the group action on the hidden features is up to you and that that choice is really important for learning um, is because part of what makes our work work well and better than other methods is, is we make a very specific choice. So um, 
One of the early findings in equivariant neural networks is that the regular representation for finite groups, so representation of dimension n for a group of order n, worked best. Um, but for infinite groups like SO2, which is the group of continuous rotations in a plane, right, there is no regular representation. Um, so what we do is we um, replace this with the L2 space for SO2. So basically what this is, is our hidden features are functions from circles to the real numbers. So I've sort of visualized this, right? Here's a circle and it's got different colors on it in different spots, right? And those colors represent the value of the function at that angle on the circle. And if you like, you can cut it at this red ribbon and make it look like a vector, but just remember that the end, if I go past the end of the vector, I should come back on the top, right? And now again, it is a computer and a function from S1 to R would be an infinite value. So practically you do need to discretize, um, but then when we read values out of the function, we actually do read a different value for every angle by using an nth order interpolation scheme across the um, discrete values that we store. Um, and of course, as a hidden feature, this makes a great representation for SO2. How do I rotate a function on the circle? Well, I just translate the inputs and move all the values over. So these are the hidden features that make our model work well. Okay, and now, as I, we talked about early on, right? The um, usual values in a neural network are vectors. Right? And usually those vectors are transformed in the layers of the neural network by a matrix multiplication and the output is a new vector. So I am proposing to replace these vectors with values along a circle. And so we get to do the fun thing of saying that instead of matrix multiplication, we're going to convolve over a torus, um, which is basically just a straightforward generalization of, of a matrix multiplication operator if you happen to have inputs and outputs that are functions on a circle. Um, so that's fun. Okay, um, so all of that is essentially happening in um, the fiber space. So what do we do sort of on the base space? So let me explain. So if you're familiar with the conv2d operation, um, you said 50 minutes is how long I'm supposed to talk for, is that right? Yeah, but you can, you, you can have a five owners like, how, how many pages do you still have? Oh, I mean, I'll just, you know, kind of stop somewhere relevant. It's okay. So like five more minutes? Yeah, it's, it, you can, yeah, that's five good. more minutes, that, that's reasonable, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll just, show, I'll just, uh, yeah, I only have like one or two more things I sort of want to say. So this is how we make the network equivariant. Um, so basically, this is the operation that gives you conv2d, okay? So it takes a vector and we apply, um, sort of like, what do I want to say? Uh, actually, I think I'll just basically skip this slide because, um, so no, I don't want to skip this slide. So basically in a conv2d situation, here's what you have. You have a something like a three by three kernel. This is the familiar situation for machine learning. And at every point in the kernel, you would have a matrix of weights that is C in by C out, okay? So in a continuous convolution setting, basically what we're going to do is we're going to replace this grid with a polar coordinate grid. And since we've replaced matrices with tori at every point in the polar coordinate grid, we have a torus. So this is kind of a straightforward generalization of conv2d. Okay, and then this is, I think, um, one of the, the cooler things. So going way back to our warm up, um, we sort of saw, right? I'll actually go all the way back just to show you. Um, right, so. This is what we saw, right? We saw that when we impose equivariance, our eight dimensional space of weights went down to two dimensionals because of a linear constraint. So here in this sort of high dimensional setting, I wanna show you exactly how that happens. Oh, sorry. So normally, uh, normally what you would have in a uh, sitting like this, right, is we would have, these are the, the cells in our kernel in our, like, it's not a three by three kernel, it's a one, two, three by 16 kernel, right? These would all be freely trainable weights, right? But the group action by rotation relates some of these positions to other positions, okay? So here's how this method works. You choose a fundamental domain for the action of rotation on this grid. Right? So these four sort of cells of the grid form a fundamental domain. Under rotation, they're going to go to all the other cells of the grid. Right? 
then these will all be freely trainable weights. So you can learn whatever values you want for these. But in order to enforce equivariance, right, we have to follow this conjugation relationship. This, this is sort of like um, the group action acts on the left and the right, and this is the linear constraint. And so using this, um, can, this group uh, equivariance constraint, what we see is that if I want to look at the weights over here at this rotated position, they are going to be equal to the weights at where they're freely trainable, but transformed by the group action, the circular shifting group action on the fiber, right? Um, so basically, the point is that in a non-equivariant neural network, all of the weights across this entire kernel would be trainable. But in our setting, only the weights along the fundamental domain are tra trainable, and then the weights are shared to the other positions in the kernel using the group action. So that's that's the idea. So basically, it's the orbit stabilizer um, decomposition of the space that gives you the weight sharing scheme. You just share the weights along the orbits, um, which is OK, what I've written here. And then it is worth pointing out that um, at the uh, origin, right? This is not a free. This is not a, a a free orbit where the group acts transitively. So at the origin, all the rotations actually fix this point, right? And that means that the group action relates the weights at this point to itself, right? And that means that is not just a way of sharing, but it is actually a constraint on the weights that can appear here. So the weights at the origin are not freely trainable. They have to satisfy some additional linear constraint, and um, this picture should look familiar from the beginning, right? Because SO2 is the continuous version of cyc the cyclic group. And indeed, what we get is some continuous version of the circulant matrix at that point. OK, uh, so that's the way the weight sharing works. And um, this is just some results table that says that we win. We get lower error than the other methods. We get lower error than non-equivariant methods. We get lower error than methods that don't use um, circle circle features for the hidden layers um and this is the other so this is my this is this will be my last slide so to me this is sort of the big selling point of why it's worth studying representation theory to do neural networks so if you are sitting in that autonomous car that is avoiding um crashing into other cars with this neural network thing in it you have to have some trust for your neural network right and so you would like it to behave in provably um, consistent ways. So here is what I have as a scene. There's a red car turning left, OK? Um, and down here is exactly the same scene. I literally just took the same data and I rotated it 130 degrees, OK? Here is the prediction of the non-equivariant model. So notice simply rotating the input data changes the prediction of the non-equivariant model. In this case, it predicts a right turn, and in this case, it predicts a left turn. So that means depending on you know, what arbitrary angle you happen to approach the intersection from, a neural network is capable of making inconsistent predictions. Whereas if you enforce our known symmetry that this problem has, then you see that the neural network consistently and correctly predicts a left turn um, in both cases. So um, that is my talk, and thank you very much. Thanks. This is a very, very cool, very interesting talk. Any questions so far? No question? Then I will ask some questions. Um, um, uh, I have a couple of questions. Let me stop the